Welcome to Neo-Paganism and New Religious Movements at Cherry Hill Seminary, course C1521. I will be your professor, Michael Stramiska. For this week, our main text will be John Saliba's Understanding New Religious Movements. As his photo suggests, Dr. Saliba is a Jesuit who taught 44 years at the University of Detroit, Mercy, 1970-2014. Despite his Christian affiliation, he has been praised as being among the most insightful and most impartial scholars of new religious movements. He has an international background. Born in Malta, he later studied in London and then in the USA, and he earned his PhD at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. In Chapter 1, Pref Professor Saliba gives an overview of definitions and various aspects and applications of the term cult. He notes that it originally comes from a Latin verb, colera, meaning to tend, to till, the root of such words as cultivate, culture, and respect. So the basic meaning relates to agriculture. But it came eventually to refer to religious behavior, honoring a god or goddess through specific actions. And I think it's kind of nice to think of this of religion as something that people cultivate. The Latin term cultus refers to styles of worship and ritual among particular religious groups. That is the cult of Mithra, the worship of Mithra, the cult of the mother goddess, the styles of ritual and worship related to the mother goddess the Christian cult of the saints, and so on. So it's actually quite a recent narrowing of the meaning of cult to limit its scope to only describing religious groups with a harmful antisocial character or purpose. But that is indeed the prevalent meaning in our time. Saliba then explores why has there been this highly negative reframing of cult that labels new minority or alternative religions as inherently harmful, dangerous, and sinister. He notes that different parties have applied this negative cult concept to suit their own interests and to advance them. The mass media, psychiatrists, Christian religious leaders, anti-cult deprogrammers, so we can ask, what benefit does each party derive from their usage of cult as a weapon of verbal attack against a particular form of religion? To begin with the media, scary stories of evil religious groups going back at least to Charles Manson's family, if not earlier, have proven a sure way of capturing readers and viewers. And we can then ask, why do psychiatrists like to speak of cults in a disparaging manner? Well, let's consider that psychiatry and psychology and religion and spirituality are first of all competitors in our larger social and cultural framework for providing meaning and consolation to suffering people. And in fact, there's a long history of hostility toward religion and psychiatry going back at least to Sigmund Freud. Freud viewed religion as wish fulfillment, illusion, and a vestige of childhood desires for either mystical oblivion, and here you might remember if you've studied uh, the history of psychology, Freud had this idea of the, the oceanic feeling, which he felt was a desire to, to be back in the warm, friendly fluids of the womb during pregnancy, or a search for fatherly authority to have a big father figure to take care of everything. More recent psychology refrains from passing such judgments on long established religions, but it seems that new religions are seen as fair game Furthermore, the group 
ethos, the community emphasis of most religion goes against the ethos of individualism that is favored in psychiatry and psychology. Indeed, it is no mystery that in our time as in the past, many people suffering with emotional disturbances, psychological crises or traumas turn to religion and that some psychological ailments may express themselves through religious imagery and some religious groups are known to indeed take advantage of people with such emotional problems. Psychiatrists, therefore, have reason to be concerned with religion and new religious movements or cults. For Christian religious leaders, religion itself is not a problem, just the wrong kind of religion, that is to say, any religion but theirs. For Christian leaders, the term cults helps to classify new and unfamiliar forms of religion as mistaken, invalid, even evil, and to maintain boundaries between good religion, Christianity, and false, misleading, possibly evil religions, such as new religious movements. And let's consider that new religious movements are also direct competitors with Christian groups in the spiritual marketplace, adding self-interest to the hostility here. But ironically, some Christian sects or groups may themselves have cultish features. Looking at anti-cult activists and anti-cult deprogrammers, we find that they are entirely dependent on the public perception of new religious movements as dangerous cults, and it is in their interest to encourage fear and hostility toward new or unusual forms of religion, rather than trying to foster any sympathy or understanding. And they till on fertile ground. There are always fearful reactions toward new and unusual religions, as well as new religious movements that seal themselves off from society, that seek to control or abuse their members, or that violate accepted social norms. And so, the anti-cult activists and deprogrammers rarely lack for customers. Saliba provides us an overview of different Christian theological perspectives on religious groups which are classified as cults for the following reasons. One, the group is seen as a cult because it denies or misinterprets biblical doctrines. Two, the group differs from others that are seen as normative, that is to say mainstream Protestant or Catholic denominations. Three, the group claims to possess new revelations beyond the testimony provided in the Bible. Four, the group claims authority based on religious experience rather than on scripture, doctrine, or tradition. However, these points could also be applied to many Christian denominations in their early history. They often performed all of these functions and were seen as heretical, dangerous, demonic, and only when they became established and had a large membership were they eventually accepted. And it goes without saying, these Christian views of religion are to totally unable to reckon with non-Christian, non-biblical forms of religion. <clears throat> so they're useful for us to understand as a Christian perspective that totally rejects such types of religion as modern paganism, but they really don't tell us very much at all about paganism. And one rhetorical and conceptual device 
that we find deployed in times is extending a certain Christian centric framing of cults to non-Christian religious groups by applying a certain logic, the logic of differing from the norm, meaning that something differing from the norm is inherently a problem. So new or non-traditional religious groups that differ from the main forms of the religion to which they are related can thus be defined as cults. More simply put, new or non-traditional forms of religion can be classified as cults. And then, in a way, the job is done. You frame them as something dangerous, evil, something not worth respecting. And so the dominant religion of Christianity, or it might be something different in a different society, can then just roll on secure in its dominance. All of these views and definitions are based on an understanding of religion as a fixed set of beliefs, practices, and scriptures controlled by a central authority which determines proper thought and conduct. Yet this is somewhat of a falsification of the reality of religions across time, because the history of religions worldwide shows us religions experience constant change challenge, variation, and reinterpretation. And so these theological definitions of cult as abnormal, untrue, invalid, are grounded in a basic opposition to religious pluralism and fail to account for the proliferation and appeal of non-Christian religions, which many evangelical Christians do not accept as valid on principle. Psychological definitions address other issues, but also tend to view cults in an exclusively negative light. The psychological model of cults highlights harmful leaders and fragile followers as a basic paradigm. And we might speak of this as wolves and sheep this model presupposes that religious movements are only formed for nefarious purposes by charismatic, psychopathic leaders who prey on alienated, emotionally damaged people who are in search of security and purpose. This psychological framing of religion as harmful leaders preying on the fragile overlooks the reality that most of us are at some times, to some degree, at some points in our lives, alienated, emotionally damaged, and in search of security and purpose. Nonetheless, hard line anti-cult views in psychology or psychiatry are often the result of actual clinical experience, dealing with patients who report horrifying, damaging experiences in cults. In other words, psychiatrists and psychologists do in fact encounter people who have been damaged by religious movements. The problem arises in the extent to which all new religious movements are viewed through the single prism by people in the psychiatric field. One immense irony is that modern psychology from psychoanalysis to whatever is in fashion in psychiatry today could also be said to involve authoritative leaders who make their living preying on or excuse me caring for the emotionally damaged and alienated this parallel may even be extended further might not psychotherapy and psychiatric treatment be said to be forms of mind control or brainwashing that involve indoctrination encourage dependence and insist on obedience after all some former psychiatric patients make accusations of harm or abuse against their therapists and shrinks psychiatric hospitals can be as closed abusive and scary as any cult compound therefore 
simply because someone forms a religious group that caters to needy people by offering security and purpose it should not be assumed out of hand that such a leader is a cunning wolf nor should it be assumed that all the followers or participants in this new religion are mindless sheep and just to take the other side of that there is indeed the possibility of manipulative leaders who take advantage of emotionally frail people, but this needs to be proven. It certainly should not be assumed. And to say more on the same point, we should keep in mind that there are indeed religious movements who le whose leaders and followers do seem to behave as wolves and as sheep. This, however, is something that needs to be approached very critically and carefully, not taken lightly, not assumed, because such accusations can be very harmful in and of themselves and can be used to target people who are, in fact, innocent of these accusations. On another note, Saliba comments that psychologists have also seen examples of helpful healthy new religious movements or cults. Some have made a definite, observable, positive difference in people's lives, helping them overcome addictions or other difficulties and become more stable, more secure, and more functional. In fact, such new religious movements could even be viewed as alternative forms of therapy. The psychologist Mark Galanter notes that new religious movements may indeed assist psychological health, if not necessarily advancing social adjustment. And what he means there is that they may make people more healthy, but yet they may put them in a marginal social position. Another way that new religious movements or cults are disparaged is by looking at them and accusing them of being anti-family in that they sometimes create a divide between children and their parents. If the parents are, say, Orthodox Jews or devout Catholics, and the child becomes a Buddhist or a Hare Krishna follower, of course, this is creating a tension in the family. This overlooks the natural tendency of children to question and rebel against parental authority and the possibility that families may themselves be highly dysfunctional, parents may be abusive, in which case a new religious movement may not be the problem, but a solution. In providing the individual with some alternative to an unhealthy family situation. Saliba notes that a general weakness of psychological definitions of cults is the emphasis on individual psychology, looking at leaders or looking at followers, but not at the larger cultural factors and social conditions that create the need for new religious movements or that form the basis of their appeal. In other words, Saliba is saying psychology can be too individualistic in how it looks at religion and that we need to consider the larger social and cultural framework. This is where sociology and anthropology prove their usefulness in situating new religious movements or in cults in larger social and cultural frameworks. Taking a less judgmental view than theologians or psychiatrists, sociologists have studied new religious movements or cults as social phenomena. And in fact, it's sociologists who coined the term new religious movements, also speaking of alternative, fringe, and non-traditional religions or religious movements in preference to the term cult. Saliba himself expresses his own personal view in which he has some reservations about the term new religious movement. He notes there is often nothing very new in such groups 
as they tend to often simply repackage and reinterpret old beliefs and practices. However, it should be said, a new package is not without significance. As any marketing executive for a major consumer product corporation will tell you. New religious movements may express rising social needs and concerns and shifts in spirituality. That is another aspect of their significance that sociologists have called attention to. Saliba lists a number of positive and negative features that have been noted by sociologists. On the positive side, joy and enthusiasm, an emphasis on religious experience, which can assist in recovery from drug and alcohol abuse, beneficial spiritual practices such as meditation, and relief from the stress that many people feel living in mainstream society. On the negative side, new religious movements may display overpowerful leaders, a discouragement of rational thought. They may involve deceptive recruitment promises, psychological manipulation. They may enforce isolation from society on the part of its members. There may be a pattern of totalitarian control of people's lives by the leader of the group or the group itself. There is sometimes a problem of economic exploitation with cult members made to work at businesses operated by the religious movement. There may be antisocial attitudes which could translate into antisocial actions there may be weak ethics, a lack of clear boundaries or protection of individuals within the group. There may be end of the world beliefs or what we might call apocalyptic beliefs that could generate violent actions. And there may be various tendencies to secrecy and to violence in such groups. So these are among the negative potentials of religious movements as discussed by Saliba. Looking at the work of other scholars, Saliba notes that J. Gordon Melton, who's quite prominent figure in the study of new religious movements, offered a schema dividing new religious movements into 24 categories or families. Half of these Christian groups, the others Eastern or Middle Eastern derived, and then some that are occult, New Age, or eclectic. Melton's classificatory scheme is important because it puts all the NRMs on equal footing. Rather than a most older schema, which tended to privilege the Christian groups, putting them in a positive light, while regarding all of the non-Christian groups together as movements to be treated with suspicion. Though our interest is most of all in the non-Christian varieties of new religious movements, some features of the Christian NRM families noted by Melton are worthy of notice as they have features also shared by non-Christian religious movements. Pentecostalism, dating just from 1901, is now a major worldwide denomination, emphasizing heteroglossia, the phenomenon of speaking in tongues, which despite what Pentecostalists may believe is not unique to its religion or Christianity, but in fact has parallels in trance and possession practices found in other religions and indeed other non-Christian new religious movements. Then another group of interest is the Christian Science, Metaphysical or New Thought family of NRMs. And here's something very important that becomes influential or has become influential in many religious groups and indeed 
modern pop culture is to focus on individual psychology and meditation for harmonizing the inner self with higher power. And then a family that comes much closer to pagan type religions, spiritualism, paranormal, paranormalism, and new age treated as a single family. And here we see 19th century beliefs in contacting spirits of the dead, helping to lead to ESP paranormal based groups concerned with cultivating hidden powers in and beyond oneself, leading the 1970s to New Age Eclecticism, which then added on many Eastern religion elements. Leaving the Christian sphere, Melton via Saliba introduces us to the magical family, including witchcraft revival movements like Wicca, Neo-Paganism or Modern Paganism, and Satanism. The grouping of all these groups together is somewhat dubious, as witchcraft and paganism share a basis in pre-Christian European traditions, which is not so much true of Satanism, which, depending on which version you're looking at, is more a parody and inversion of Christianity than a revived European tradition, as Wicca and paganism purport to be. Melton, in making this grouping together seems to be following the popular view that equates witchcraft and paganism with devil worship though neither new religious movement has anything to do with satan which they reject as a fundamentally christian concept satanism is not well defined <clears throat> and may be more of a media phenomenon than an actual religious movement although this is debatable and there are scholars attempting to define and document Satanism. However, what's less disputable is that the linkage with Satanism has greatly damaged the public image of Wicca and paganism because it feeds into the very perception that I suspect is influencing Melton here, lumping together Wicca and paganism with worship of Satan. The definition of Satanism is indeed extremely confusing, as there are many different versions of Satanism, from Hollywood fantasies to antisocial activities and crimes carried out by individuals claiming to be Satanists, to an actual Church of Satan founded by Anton LaVey in 1966. In this church, Satan seems to mainly function as a marker of an unconventional morality, supposedly the satanic opposite of bourgeois Christianity, and a free-thinking lifestyle centered on total materialism and radical individualism. These ideas seem to have more to do with Ayn Rand, indeed a proponent of total materialism and radical individualism, who is now a darling of the modern-day conservative movement, and also Friedrich Nietzsche, a critic of Christian morality and also indeed a proponent of individualism, than any worship of Satan as a supernatural being. This is what makes it difficult to define Satanism, or at least the Church of Satan, as a religious movement. Peter Gilmore the current high priest of the Church of Satan explains, Satanism does not allow for distortions, such as belief in cosmic entities, animal sacrifice, or claims that one is a demon incarnate, amongst other theistic delusions. And he goes on, Satanism cannot be stretched to promote criminal behavior and mindless hedonism. These ideas are at odds with the logical and life-celebrating demeanor of the skeptical Epicurean atheism that is our axiomatic philosophy. So for me, looking at this as a scholar of religious movements, what he's framing here really does seem to be more 
of a philosophical outlook than a religion. And this is what makes the definition issue very complicated here. Nevertheless, in popular culture and anti-cult belief, Satanism equals devil worship plus orgiastic rituals plus animal and or child sacrifice. This is the common image. The only link to pagan tra traditions that celebrate deified forces of nature is the image of the horned god, which probably was taken from indigenous European iconography. As noted before, there was a massive media-fed concern with the supposed widespread of practice of Satanism in the 1980s that is now looked back on with regret as the Satanic Panic. For all these reasons, Melton's grouping together of Satanism with Paganism and Wicca is inaccurate and regrettable. Paganism and Wicca, however, do belong together as they derive from common roots in European myth and folklore and both involve the invocation of pre-Christian European deities and sometimes other deities and traditions as well. But there tends to be a primary European focus digging into such traditions as the Celtic, the Norse, and others. Wicca differs from paganism in its emphasis on magic, while paganism is more concerned with myths, rituals, and ethnic traditions and identity. The very negative associations of Wicca and paganism with Satanism, human sacrifice, and child abuse in the 1980s gave way to much more positive images in the 1990s and 2000s. The mass media seemed to fall in love with witches and pagans for a time. From TV shows like Charmed and Buffy the Vampire Slayer to the Harry Potter Empire. As we reach the end of this first chapter in Saliba's book, I'll add some commentary about Saliba's thinking and method. I would note that he covers a lot of ground in this chapter, which is very admirable. But there is something important missing. His focus on psychological, sociological, and anti-cult views and approaches to the study of new religious movements in this chapter leaves out one very important method. <clears throat> Ethnography, that is anthropology. And this is also used in some forms of sociology. The ethnographic anthropological approach insists that no valid knowledge of any culture, society, subculture, or social group is possible without the researcher spending time in the community <clears throat> and gaining firsthand knowledge of the people and their way of life. And the same very much applies to the study of religious groups. Saliba, to his credit, does take this up later in chapter four on sociology. Some of the worst errors and excesses of the other models and views of NRMs described by Saliba might have been reduced or avoided if the researchers had actually spent time in these religious groups getting to know the members as people through direct and counter observation and interaction rather than jumping to conclusions based on preconceived notions or sensationalistic media reports. In my own work, studying a number of pagan groups in Iceland, Lithuania, Latvia, and the USA, as well as Eastern religion movements in Lithuania, I developed a much deeper understanding of these NRMs and often a high degree of sympathy and respect for them by getting to know actual individuals and hearing their own stories and perspectives. In speaking of an ethnographic anthropological approach, an important related concept <clears throat> is a distinction in anthropology between emic and etic modes of understanding and analysis. Emic means the insider point of view, how the culture, society, social, or religious group 
looks to those inside the group. And this is in contrast to the edic mode, the outsider point of view, which gives us the way that the society looks to those outside of the group, which could very well include, of course, anthropologists and other researchers. Most of the models and methods we study thus far are strictly etic, viewing NRMs from the outside perspective of Christian theologians, journalists, psychiatrists, and sociologists. Although an important side note is that psychiatrists and sociologists may also utilize an emic approach. <clears throat> the more emic insider-oriented approach can have its own problems, of course, such as the researcher becoming overly partial toward the group under study. This is sometimes called going native among anthropologists to poke fun at the idea that the anthropologist may forget that he or she or they is outside the group and may wish to be treated and perceived and to feel as an insider. Both points of view are valuable though. I, I don't wish to make it make a point that everything should be done from the emic point of view. Both are valuable. But I would say any research that completely fails to take in the emic point of view is missing quite a lot and may end up with a very unbalanced understanding. And now we move on to chapter two, the history of new religious movements in the West in which Saliba attempts to give a historical overview of new religious movements. <clears throat> so first question, what's so new about new religious movements? And Saliba again notes that in fact, many new religious movements are not all that new and that they often repackage old ideas and beliefs such as for example reincarnation saliba notes that this idea this belief is extremely old and can even be found in the history of christianity even so the nrm new religious movement label is useful for marking the continual development of new forms of religion, including new subtypes or spin-offs of existing religions, new religious movements that are not entirely new, but more like we might say new-ish. Saliba then gives examples from Christian history, such as Gnosticism, a movement from around the time of Christ, the Cathars in the 1100s, the Flagellants, not to be confused with the Flagellants in the 1100s, the Ranters in the 1600s, Jewish Shabbatianism, which in fact we're going to look at in a later unit of this class, and Mormonism in the 19th century. Mormonism is an interesting case actually because most people outside of Mormonism looking at it would see it as a variation of Christianity, but Mormons tend to see it as a distinctive religion of its own. None of these movements were entirely new, but they mixed old traditions and beliefs with some new ideas <clears throat> or interpretations to arrive at, shall we say, old wine and new bottles, new bottles, with a little bit of extra spice. Drawing conclusions about these past new religious movements, Saliba sees the following patterns. One, these NRMs tended to offer either greater strictness of lifestyle and moral standards or a relaxation of such strictness. This is actually quite interesting to apply to pagan movements and other NRMs today because there's often an assumption across society that modern people like to have freedom, individuality, and not be subjected to any kind of standards or restrictions. But in fact, 
it sometimes happens that religious movements that offer a very restricted lifestyle are very appealing to some segment of the population because it seems that some people find a very free, open lifestyle or society very threatening and they like to have tight boundaries and strict regulations to keep them on the straight and narrow path. Many people seem to find this psychologically comforting. Saliva notes number two, established religious authorities have typically reacted to the rise of these new religious movements by essentially freaking out and persecuting them. Most of these NRMs, if not extinguished by such gentle methods of social disapproval as burning at the stake and so forth, evolved over time to become more mainstream and they eventually came to be accepted into society or in some cases co-opted by the dominant forms of religion. So what is the effect of these NRMs? Well, we can look back and say that they often help to shake up and wake up established forms of religion, showing the need to incorporate new and different elements of belief, practice, organization, etc. Moving on to chapter three, the new religious movements in psychological perspective, Saliba notes typical questions asked about NRMs from the psychological point of view. Is there a particular type of person who joins NRMs? A cult personality? Is there a particular personality formation or diagnosis that leads people to be interested in NRMs and or cults? Do new religious movements prey on the psychologically weak and vulnerable? Another question often asked, do people join and stay in NRMs out of free choice or are they psychologically manipulated and coerced, their free will compromised or broken? Saliba then paints a mixed picture in response to these questions. Reports of some people damaged, some helped <clears throat> by new religious movements. Some members who do seem like mindless slaves, others who seem quite rational and independent and so on, pointing out that there's a wide range of people who come into new religious movements for a wide range of motivations. So again, we see that it's impossible to make any blanket statement covering all cases and types of new religious movements. Again, we see the need for in-depth ethnographic study to more fully understand NRMs as a social and spiritual phenomenon. A problem with some psych psychological perspectives on NRMs is their assumption of a generic normality <clears throat> that NRMs and their followers deviate from. And to give a parallel example, the American Psychiatric Association labeled homosexuality an illness until 1973, but does not do so anymore, showing how these scientific views and labels change over time, along with the conception of so-called normality. Insofar as new religious movements offer responses to and critiques of mainstream society, they might be seen as sometimes functioning as canaries in the coal mine, calling attention to unmet needs and unanswered problems. For example, the communal nature of many NRMs with the individual subordinated to the group questions the high value American society places on individualism. It shows that many people may be seeking an alternative to that value. 
Saliba then describes how psychological studies have called attention to certain types of individu individuals who are often attracted to NRMs. One, the so-called deprived individual, the alienated individual, the religiously inclined individual, the identity-seeking individual, and the individual in crisis. And if you look at the chapter, there's some explanation of each of these categories. Each of these could be viewed as representing deficits within persons or within society. If we ask who or what caused the individual to feel deprived, alienated, lacking in identity or overwhelmed by crisis. Are the new religious movements that cater to these individuals causing, exploiting, or curing these socio-psychological ills? And again, <clears throat> we see the value and limitation of a psychological approach. Very good at getting at how individuals relate to society and religion, but very bad at taking into account the bigger picture, the larger context. Saliba then critiques these different categories put forward as psychological explanation of who comes to new religious movements and why. He begins with the deprived individual. Supposedly, such a person lacks basic material or emotional security, which they then obtain from the new religious movement. However, Saliba notes that, in fact, many individuals come to new religious movements from fairly secure middle to upper class backgrounds, meaning they don't seem to be materially lacking. However, on the other hand, it is true they might feel other lacks and needs, such as a need for purpose or support or a lack of love and guidance. Moving on to this other concept or category of the alienated individual, such a person is typically presented as a social misfit, estranged from family or society, who finds a new sense of belonging in a new religious movement. Now, the way this is discussed, new religious movements are sometimes blamed for dividing people from family or society but on the other hand, a new religious movement may just as well be a response to such a problem rather than its cause. However, it is true that new religious movement membership can cause strains in relations with family or others. But of course, so can many things. A choice of television programs, sports team affiliations, hairstyles and so on and so on. So simply causing a strain in families is not really unique to new religious movements. But the extreme case is that membership in the NRM causes someone to completely break off relations with their former families. And now speaking for myself, I would note that there's a problematic assumption in this chapter. The assumption that joining a new religious movement means a radical departure from mainstream society, an either or choice to either be in society or be in the movement. Well, why not both? Many people maintain perfectly conventional lives while also being members or participants in new religious movements. In all religions, from the Catholics to the Krishnas, we find people who participate only part-time or occasionally who are casual rather than devout believers. The assumption that new religious movement members are totally cut off from ordinary society plays to the cult stereotype. And I would say what's needed here or what would be better is more of a spectrum approach saying that some people who are involved in religion remain totally connected 
to mainstream society, to their families, etc. And then there may be some who, as they get more involved in religion, they may become somewhat disengaged from mainstream society. And at the extreme, those who become totally cut off and isolated, but that would only be a small minority of people who participate in or who join new religious movements. Saliba also discusses the frequently proposed category of the religiously inclined as people who tend to join new religious movements. And the religiously inclined is defined as a person with a need for a definite belief system or a desire to save the world. Saliba expresses regret that in his view, the modern spiritual market place or spiritual supermarket offers too many choices and not enough guidance, leading some to join NRMs. And here I think perhaps a little bit of Catholic bias is uh, at play here, because certainly from the point of view of major religions like the Catholic Church, they would be very happy if there were no religious movements at all, no alternative forms of religion, and just a very small menu from which people could pick. That would suit them very well. So Libla clearly regrets that the trend of secularization which has limited expression of mainstream religion in public places, has given an opening to marginal and alternative religions. Again, a very Catholic-oriented point of view. Yes, in these complaints, Saliba seems to betray his personal religious commitment as a Jesuit and a certain nostalgia for the good old days of Christian dominance. This brings up an important and influential sociological concept, the so-called secularization theory. Sociologists such as Peter Berger, Thomas Luckman, <clears throat> and Robert Bella in the 1960s proposed that as society becomes more modern, more scientific, and hence more secular, interest in religion declines and will ultimately vanish altogether. This thinking has very old roots, going back in some ways even to the Protestant Reformation, which sought to cleanse Christianity of superstitions and illogicalities. Late 19th and early 20th century sociologists such as August Comte, Max Weber, and Emil Durkheim also expected religion to decline and dissolve. In more recent decades, the secularization theory has been largely, if not totally, disproven, as religion seems to be thriving, not declining. Though many societies restrict the role of religion in public life, in private life, religion is booming. Furthermore, fundamentalist forms of many religions are thriving, along with New Age and, last but not least, new religious movements. Saliba's lament about secularization seems to mainly be that state authorities can no longer endorse and enforce a single religion, as was the case with Christianity in Europe. So once again, we see his Jesuit point of view. On a more even playing field, Christianity has to compete with other faiths, including new religious movements, in the spiritual supermarket in which buyers or consumers can pick and choose between different religions and even horror of horrors blend bits and pieces from different traditions together if they so choose. Saliba then explores the proposal that individuals come to new religious movements to solve their identity crisis because they are in search of an identity. And in this model, adolescents rejecting parental authority may look to alternative forms of authority and thus join an NRM. Modern society's pluralism and individualism 
may, according to Saliba, cause an identity crisis, which joining a new religious movement can resolve. And he observes that the modern feeling of living in an impersonal world leaves many people hungry for a sense of special meaning and purpose that can be provided by a new religious movement. Modern society's promotion of a self-centered, even narcissistic view of life, which in recent times we find referred to as everyone's personal journey, may lead a seeker to a new religious movement that offers the hope of self-realization. And now to give some response, there's a glaring problem with these paradigms that Saliba reviews, which purport to explain from a psychological point of view why individuals join new religious movements or cults. These models could apply just as well to mainstream and traditional religions. Poor, deprived people in many countries often find comfort and support in Christianity and Islam. New religious movements are not alone in offering community and belonging to the alienated or providing a way station for a narcissistic personal journey. Going back to the list of issues noted in the chapter, another charge frequently leveled at NRMs is that they engage in overly aggressive methods of proselytization. Well, sure, this can be true of some NRMs, but certainly not all of them. And it certainly is also true of mainstream religions like Islam and Christianity. So in this chapter, we see proven a very unfortunate point that often the standard applied to new religious movements is not the same one applied to established mainstream religions. And here we could point to a political factor. Established religions have a lot of authority and power in society, including some influence in politics. And so criticizing them can be socially and politically risky. You could lose your job. If you're a politician, you could lose popularity. If you're a celebrity, you might lose popularity if you criticize mainstream religions. But new religious movements are typically small. They have less power and influence. And so they're easy scapegoats to pick on. Perhaps the most sensational NRM issue raised by psychologists is the profile of the leaders, which Saliba optimistically terms the psychopathology of cult leaders. No one would doubt that Charles Manson or Shoko Asahara of the Om Shinrikyo or Jim Jones should rate high on any scale of dangerous psychopathology. But the same could be said of any number of corporate CEOs, political leaders, etc. It does not follow that all leaders or founders of NRMs are, to use the colloquial term, psychos. True to the old maxim, there are good and bad people in every group. Saliba notes that along with some truly dreadful NRM leaders, others seem fairly benign, even normal. In this chapter, Saliba also calls attention to the supposedly unhealthy relationship between NRM leaders and their followers with a comparison to Eastern gurus and their disciples. Again, Saliba delivers a split decision, some evidence of psychopathology in some cases, but not in all cases. Oddly, the psychologist patient relationship is not brought up for comparison, although it would seem another parallel case. This shows a tendency to judge new religious movements and their leaders by harsher standards than similar aspects of mainstream religions and institutions.
institutions. In your professor's opinion, a better standard to apply to a new religious movement or indeed any other institution is how it responds when abuses occur. Does it deny them, excuse them, hide them, or face up to them and seek to remedy such problems in the present and prevent them in the future? <clears throat> because after all, human beings being a varied lot, to say the least, in any institution, you, you will at times have problems with people behaving badly. And the question is not, how could you prevent this from ever happening at all? That's impossible. But what do you do when this happens? How do you deal with it? And how do you try to reduce such occurrences? As we examine various NRMs in the course of the class, you'll see examples of both types of responses. That is groups that face up to problems and try to remedy them, and others that simply deny them and try to hide them. This is the crucial difference that distinguishes healthier NRMs from more dysfunctional and pathological ones. And the same principle could indeed be applied to other institutions. So this is a wider social problem. It's not specific to religions. Further along in the chapter, Saliba presents research that shows much greater psychological health among NRM members than was suggested in older research and cult stereotypes. Research also demonstrates definite benefits of NRM practices like meditation. Research also suggests that membership in NRMs may be of psychological benefit. So Saliba concedes that many of the negative aspects that are attributed to new religious movements, such as psychological conditions they cater to or cause, could also be found in mainstream religious institutions like Catholic monasteries. And here I give Saliba some major credit because he is critiquing his own religion, which is something that is not easy for most people to do. And this also is why I find his work generally credible, because although he has a Jesuit bias, he does at times like this prove to be capable of retrospection and self-examination. Acknowledging common issues and aspects of new religious movements and traditional religions alike suggests the need to view NRMs simply as part of the overall family of religions. Younger brothers and sisters, alongside the elders like established churches and traditions, with common psychological dynamics of members and leaders. Another important issue and major theme of academic discussion is the process of conversion. The attempt to define stages that people go through in learning about a new religion, deciding to join, actually joining, and then staying or leaving. Differing models of conversion stem from which side of the situation is focused on, the new religious movement seeking new members or the individual in search of or receptive to a new religion. The study of religious conversion has interesting parallels to modern corporate advertising and marketing. In each case, a way is found to entice individuals to try, then like, then commit to new products, whether chanting Hare Krishna or downloading a new app. Corporate advertising seeks to create brand identity and to close off alternatives. As we noted last week, new religious movements are often accused of aggressive recruitment that amounts to brainwashing. But how does this compare to Christian evangelizing, military recruitment, or corporate advertising? I would say there are a lot of common elements here. Once again, new religious movements seem to be judged by standards 
not always applied to other institutions with equal or greater weight. Accepting that what is said of conversion to NRMs could also apply to other sectors in society, different paths that lead to joining NRMs have been identified. Aggressive recruitment causing sudden violent transformation and total commitment is one mode that's been identified in comparison to passive drifting in which people gradually come to know a new religious movement and then undergo a growth toward commitment in stages. A good deal of psychological research is in this vein, trying to calculate the degree, extent, and intensity of very aspect, various aspects of NRMs. From the pre prevalence of psychological disorders, the level of commitment to the NRM, the intensity of recruitment, and emotional and cognitive factors that attract converts and the types of activities that recruits find rewarding are all major issues of interest. Saliba wades into anthropological waters at one point by raising the issue of whether young people's participation in, in NRMs could be viewed as a kind of rite of passage. He draws on famous anthropological studies by Arnold von Gennep and Victor Turner, which see these rites as a way of leaving childhood, losing one's old identity, and then assuming a new identity. In Turner's terms, the first stage is preliminal, a movement towards separation from the old community and identity. The second stage is the liminal stage, a period of separation with the full breakdown of the old identity and initiation into a new identity. And third comes the post-liminal stage that involves reintegration into the larger community with the new identity accepted. Saliba's take on the rite of passage theory applied to new religious movements is interesting, but it seems to assume that those who join new religious movements will only stay with them temporarily. Applied to mainstream religions, this would seem to suggest that Catholic or Buddhist monasteries are, are just passing phases and that lifelong monks are stuck in adolescence. At the end of the chapter, however, Saliba notes that the evidence for new religious movements as psychologically harmful or helpful is mixed, often with very limited or very biased data. Comparing new religious movements with psychotherapy, he sees advantages in therapy's code of ethics and legal safeguards, but notes that NRMs provide a spiritual dimension lacking in psychotherapy. Moving on to chapter four, Saliba now digs more into the sociological perspective on new religious movements. And he notes that the sociological approach is distinguished from the psychological one by a focus on the NRM as a functioning social unit rather than focusing on psychological processes within individuals. NRMs from the sociological point of view are investigated as societies or subcultures onto themselves with their own rules and dynamics. Rather than assuming that NRM leaders and members are deviants, as the psychological approach tends to do, the sociology, I'm sorry, the sociologist accepts the new religious movement as a part of society that is also a mini society in itself and examines how it functions. And then additional issues are how the NRM relates to other religious groups and to society in general. Because the sociological approach tends to accept NRMs as social phenomena without passing judgment on them, this has caused conflict with the psychological approach. Because the psychological approach developed in tandem with the anti-cult movement in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, 
it shares its basic antagonism toward NRMs as, quote, dangerous cults. Behind this conflict, which first emerged in the 1960s when many NRMs began to emerge, we glimpse ghosts of that era's culture wars, which have echoes even today. Some celebrated the counterculture and alternative lifestyles, other condemned and feared these new social currents and looked for ways to label and oppose them. There is, of course, considerable overlap between psycho and sociological methods of analysis, such as a common concern with the leaders of NRMs, but where the psychological approach tends to hunt for psycho leaders, the sociological approach tends to be more interested in the role played by the leader and the institution of leadership in the religious movement, with special interest in the question of whether the new religion can function without its founder. This is the problem of succession, first noted in sociology by Max Weber, who talked about charismatic leaders and how religions often have difficulty functioning after the passing of a charismatic founding leader. Perhaps again betraying his Jesuit roots, Saliba expresses some discomfort with how the sociological approach regards all religions equally, new religious movements and established faiths alike. He notes that within religions, there are important issues of authenticity and orthodoxy that the sociological approach glosses over. Saliba worries that freely granting the title of religion to new religious movements could mean giving special status and legal protection to groups that would use religion as a cover for harmful or illegal activities. And when I read this for a moment, I thought maybe he's talking about pedophilia in the Catholic Church. But then I remembered, no, no, he's a Jesuit. This again rouses suspicion that Saliba, as a Catholic and Jesuit, may have something of a bias against new religious movements as potential competitors to his own chosen form of religion. An interesting additional point is that not all new religious movements wish to be known as religions. And Saliba cites examples both ways, those who wish to be so known and those who definitely do not. Scientology and ISKCON, the Hare Krishna movement, to give two examples, have both strived to be recognized as religions. But the TM Transcendental Meditation Movement and others have preferred to be known as educational or cultural organizations in order to avoid the scrutiny or suspicion that often attaches to self-proclaimed religious groups. And now some questions of terminology and definition. Sociologists have struggled with how to define religion. Some have coined new subcategories like quasi, implicit, secular, para, or surrogate to encompass social groupings that resemble religions or utilize religious elements, but are not exactly religions. Examples, sports, celebrity and pop music culture and their fans and followers, gamers, Alcoholics Anonymous, all of these social phenomena could be seen as somewhat religious, but it's a bit tricky to outright proclaim them as religions. Most often when these things are analyzed, people will note the parallels to religion or certain quasi-religious elements. The distinction between spirituality and religion is also a thorny issue, as is shown in the rising popularity in self-description shown often on uh, 
censuses and other survey forms where people speak of themselves as spiritual, not religious. It sounds great until you really try to define what that means, and then it, it's, it can be a bit sticky. It seems to mean feeling interested to some degree in spiritual or religious-ish matters, but not wanting to be committed to any particular religious tradition and not being a member of any religious organization. And going back to something uh, discussed earlier, the anti-cult movement, sociologists have often been in opposition to the anti-cult movement. And this is because sociologists strive to take a neutral tone toward NRMs, to be non-judgmental toward them. And this just enrages the anti-cult movement, which accuses sociologists of pro-cult sympathies. This illustrates the anti-cult movement's us versus them paradigm. For them, not condemning new religious movements or cults equals endorsing and supporting them. They don't allow any gray area. Ironically, from the sociological point of view, the ACM itself may be seen as a kind of cult or new religious movement, a fanatically anti-cult cult or anti-NRM NRM. Particularly offensive to the ACM is a key method of sociological NRM research participant observation, which we noted in the past as the ethnographic method. From the anti-cult movement, it's almost more convenient to know less about a movement, to just have a few scraps of information from which you can construct a narrative of an evil movement that you then can seek funding and support to attack and oppose. So understanding the cults or religions may not be good for business if you're in the ACM business. So going further with this, from the anti-cult point of view, social scientists who use participant observation are or become too friendly with the NRM and either fall victim to the group's deceptive methods or were perhaps pro-cult to begin with. For the ACM, no positive report of, a, of an NRM can be trusted. Only negative reports are trustworthy. Saliba gives a thoughtful account of pros and cons of participant observation and ethnographic style research. And as noted previously, this involves extended visits with the NRM, observing and participating in NRM activities, establishing relationships of trust with members, and holding extensive discussions to learn about members' experiences and perspectives. And to add a further point, you can see how this would be annoying to ACM um, professionals, because for them, there's no need to understand a cult. What you need to do is break it down, abolish it, extract people and deprogram them and that's the the extent of their interest in understanding which i would say is highly unfortunate taking a critical point of view saliba notes that the ethnographic method of participant observation assumes the sincerity and honesty of group members and the question then arises what if they are dishonest or deceptive or simply endeavor to conceal embarrassing facts. And having done a fair amount of research into religious groups, I could say this really is a difficult issue. And I would add the observation that it's not so, it's often not so much that people are consciously seeking to be deceptive or misleading about their movement. It may simply be that because they're part of it, they don't want to acknowledge negative or unpleasant factors. And then you really need the external um, point of view. And uh, you have to try to gather information from other sources, or at least speak to other members who may have different points of view. 
And in fact, in many cases, the participant observation method will work out these issues in that sustained observation and inquiry will often help to root out any such efforts at concealment or deception. A more serious problem <clears throat> of participant observation is researchers becoming too involved and beginning to identify with the NRM they are studying, thus losing objectivity and developing a pro-movement bias. Although it should be noted, this criticism is rarely applied to Christian or Jewish or other established religion scholars who are, may not ever face criticism for favoring their religion. It's much more applied to people involved with minority religions such as new religious movements. But here, as, as taking up this issue as something that should be taken seriously, <clears throat> There are certain parts of the scholarly process that can hope to uh, reduce such bias or to counterbalance it. And here, consultation of others' documents and research, interviews with ex-members of movements and their critics, and comparative study of similar NRMs can help restore perspective even if one has become attached to the movement that they are studying. A related issue, one that's very important and in a way very simple, but in reality not at all simple, is the question of objectivity versus subjectivity. Older research and older scientific thinking assumed that objectivity was a simple matter of avoiding having any personal opinions or bias in relation to the object under study. But more recently, from the 80s onwards, scholars have realized that total objectivity and zero subjectivity is impossible. It is now thought advisable for researchers to beware of and declare their own position or bias rather than pretend to not have any. And in fact, to apply this to Saliba's book, I am quite happy that he makes clear his own Jesuit identity because at certain points in his book, you can see or at least suspect that his Jesuit Catholic orientation is having some impact on how he perceives the phenomena and issues that he is discussing. But since we know where he's coming from, we can appreciate these points with greater clarity, and I think we should all strive for the same transparency and clarity. And to then be critical, self-critical of one's own position, and to include this discussion in one's research report is a very well-respected and valuable practice these days. This way, an attempt is made to be objective yet also critical about one's own inevitable subjectivity. That is to say, if you can make the effort to discuss your own subjective point of view in your research, this is an, a new way, a different way of trying to be objective. You're not trying to cleanse or remove or erase your own subjective position but you try to discuss it and be critical about it just as you would be about anyone else's point of view related to your project. However, it's important to note that the kind of acceptance of some degree of subjectivity that I am proposing here does not end the obligation to strive for objectivity and accuracy in describing new religious movements as much as possible. It's simply meant to enable a, a more rounded approach that includes the researcher and their background and perspective as part of the relevant research data. This is important because the researcher's personal attitude and perspective is likely to affect 
their interaction with the NRM and influence the kind of data they receive as well as how they interpret it. And what I mean here is that when you enter a group that you're studying, they will want to know who you are and what your perspective is. And I think in very few cases would it work well to say, I have no values, I have no perspective, I am just a, a blank recording device. No one's going to believe that. You have to be honest about who you are in your background if you want them to be honest with you. And so this may influence the kind of data you receive. And you have to then reflect on and be critical about this. Is the person telling me things a certain way because of how they perceive who I am and where I'm coming from? And these are all difficult issues, but they also can be very productive when you reflect upon them. And so all these things need to be accounted for to make the research report as complete and transparent and self-reflective as possible. The sociological approach to new religious movements also involves attempting to relate these movements to the larger society, which provides certain benefits to general understanding of NRMs. Above all, it prevents any resort to simplistic views of psychopathic wolves and weak and mindless sheep. Instead, an effort is made to detail the different functions NRMs serve in relation to social needs. As NRMs tend to be marginal rather than mainstream religions, that is, they tend to be small groups outside the mainstream of society, their social needs may re relate more to the smaller subculture or mini society of the NRM than the larger society, though these may coincide. In this way, NRMs often stand in opposition to mainstream society, and so they may be seen either as an alternative or a threat. In discussing the overall relationship to society, Saliba notes the following general functions of religion. They help in explaining the world and our place within it with a narrative that gives meaning and purpose. They express and relieve our emotional reactions to life. They enable social bonds and community and they endorse a common set of values and concerns. In a, new, in a new religious movement, these functions may shift from supporting integration into larger society to maintaining the closed society of the NRM. Although once again, I have to say, we can find this in mainstream religions like the Catholic Church also. The NRM's explanations may reject those of mainstream society and offer the NRM as the only solution to social woes, with, in the most extreme case, separation from society, fostering bonds within the NRM, and a common sense of purpose. This may seem a simple matter of mainstream religion supporting mainstream society and marginal ones opposing it. But the reality is more complex. Even mainstream religions may oppose aspects of mainstream society and culture, particularly in their formative phases. Judaism, Islam, Christianity, and Buddhism all began as opposition movements to some extent, critiquing and rejecting the dominant social or religious traditions of their time. We should also note that mainstream religions can also form the basis of political and protest movements. Looking at how religions develop over time, we see that oppositional NRMs become mainstream established religions if they manage to achieve a degree of social dominance. And so religion's adaptive function turns out to be double-edged. It could mean religion adapting to and supporting society or causing society to adapt to it, shifting the mainstream. 
The possibility of NRMs not merely opposing but shaping society helps to explain the enthusiasm for NRMs among their followers and the unease in the general society. Viewed in this way, NRMs are small-scale social experiments offering new forms and norms, which may take root in the larger society, may remain marginal, or may simply vanish altogether. NRMs may also affect society without gaining social dominance by contributing new ideas and practices that gain popularity, even if the NRM itself does not. For example, the Indian belief in reincarnation, Buddhist practices of meditation, and originally Hindu yoga are all common in America now without there having been mass conversions to Buddhism or Hinduism. Mainstream religions like Judaism and Christianity have incorporated forms of Eastern meditation into their own practices. The Hare Krishna movement using Indian food to attract Americans to their temples helped to make curry and Indian food common in American life. These adaptations of NRM elements helped open society to greater pluralism of religion and culture. A final and very productive sociological question is, why are new religious movements happening now? What's driving them nowadays? Do NRMs simply show a natural human tendency to generate new forms of religion or to revive the old ways with new variations? Or do NRMs today show the breakdown of society, the loss of old norms and traditions, and the need for new structures to live by? Or are NRMs part of a larger trend of reaction against modernity, similar to religious fundamentalism? Or do NRMs simply show the end of Christian domination of Western society, bringing new religious freedom? Or are NRMs just an outgrowth of modern pluralism and information flows via the internet, social media, etc., sparking interest in new and alternative lifestyles? I'm sure by the end of the course, you'll have answers to all these questions. And to mention one more chapter in Saliba's books, this is the discussion of the new religious movements in the law courts, dealing with the relationship between NRMs, governments, and the law. Although the principle of freedom of religion is widely respected, it's differently applied in different countries. You might say some religions turn out to be more free than others. In the USA, we have a separation of church and state, but it's not universally accepted, not even inside the USA. Often, states or state governments allow many religions, but favor one as the official or preferred state religion, like the Orthodox Church and Russia. New religious movements mainly end up in court when one, Families accuse them of kidnapping or abusing their children, and two, governments accuse them of antisocial or violent acts. As noted in our earlier discussion of the anti-cult movement, such charges are sometimes valid, sometimes not. Often, a NRM can be treated harshly by authorities due to simple intolerance of unusual religions, or because the NRM challenges the authority of mainstream institutions. For example, Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa, was accepted by the Chinese Communist government in the 1990s until it became a very large organization. And then it was seen as threatening to Communist Party control and it was brutally suppressed. There are, however, indeed cases of truly violent, antisocial, even mass murdering NRMs that are genuinely dangerous, like Aum Shinrikyo in Japan. In such cases, governments seem justified in using force. But it's very complicated how this relates to the law and to the 
common proclamation of freedom of religion. In studying new religious movement and state or government relations, several issues need to be considered. Are the accusations against the NRM valid or spurious? Have they been proven? Or are they just wild accusations that are highly beneficial to the one making the accusations? Does the NRM pose a serious threat to public safety or human rights, justifying government interference through legal action in the courts or police activity? Do members of the NRM join, stay in, and leave from the group of their own free will? Or are they coerced or restricted? And finally, is the new religious movement being targeted for repression by state authorities simply because it is a marginal or unusual religion? Or is this happening because a more accepted, more established religion wishes to wipe out its competition? its competition. These are all issues to consider. And so we come to the end of this lecture on John Saliba's fine book, Understanding New Religious Movements. It is hoped that this lecture has alerted you to the different issues involved in new religious movements and some of the different schools of thought and theoretical approaches. Bye for now.